the 14th episode of the Real Emergency Vodcast, where we will be focusing on the provision of high-performance CPR with real footage of a patient in cardiac arrest filmed from the moment of collapse to transport to the hospital. Real Emergency is produced in partnership with Hamtevi, Real DX, and 410 Medical. It's powered by Prodigy EMS. I am Hillary Gates, Director of Educational Strategy for Prodigy EMS. All of our episodes are available for you on CAPSI, uh, sorry, with CAPSI credit on Prodigy EMS. And for those of you watching live today who want to earn one hour of CE, there will be a QR code uh, on the slides at the end that you can scan with your phone camera and it'll direct you to filling out a form. Try to get that form filled out as soon as possible. We know there's some um, important deadline coming up at the end of the month and we wanna get you your credit. Let me briefly introduce our resident experts. David Spiro is a pediatric emergency physician and professor of at the University of Arkansas Medical System. He's the chief medical officer of Real DX. Mark Peel is a pediatric intensivist at WakeMed in Raleigh, North Carolina, and is a medical director with WakeMed Mobile Critical Care. Dr. Peel is also founder and chief medical officer of 410 Medical. Peter Antevi is a pediatric emergency physician, EMS physician, and founder of Pediatric Emergency Standards. Zach Dunlap is a critical care paramedic and works as a clinical education specialist for 410 Medical. And our special guest today presenting this video is uh, Dr. Bill Fales. He serves as Michigan's uh, EMS medical director and he is the chief of EMS and disaster medicine at the Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine. He's also been the EMS medical director of Kalamazoo County Medical Control Authority for nearly 30 years. Looking good, Bill. So some tips for watching today. We want you to weigh in. The panelists will ask for your feedback. Feel free to unmute your mic to chime in and uh, keep your camera on. You can also, of course, write questions in the chat and we may call on you to share. Today, you're going to be viewing footage from a big box store where an employee suffers a cardiac arrest. He receives bystander CPR, and the video overlays the audio of the dispatch, the call taking, telephone CPR instructions, as well as the cardiac monitor audio recording and display. We will highlight the importance of coordinated response and the links in the chain of survival, and we're going to hope to pass on to you all advice for how you can implement these life-saving techniques in your own system. Let's get started. Bill, over to you. Great, thanks, Hillary. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be uh, here with everyone today. Uh, and on behalf of the Kalamazoo County EMS system, and in particular, the, the agencies involved in uh, this resuscitation, uh, which is the Oshtemo Fire Department, Life EMS Ambulance, and uh, the Kalamazoo County Consolidated Dispatch Authority, uh, we are really excited to be able to share uh, this incident with you. Uh, this uh, resuscitation, I think, is relatively typical, uh, uh, good, bad, and I don't think there's a lot of ugly, but uh, good and bad with our system. What was unique is after the resuscitation, one of our firefighters happened to look up and said, you know, hey, look at those uh, cameras. I wonder if this is recorded. Uh, one thing led to another, and as Hillary mentioned, we were able to get the store security video, uh, and we were able to kind of combine that with these other than I will one dispatch audio and um, the uh uh, AED information. Uh, what you're about to see is really you've got to look at as a three act play. So the first act is going to be the collapse of uh, our patient um, through bystander care. The second act will be the resuscitation of um, uh, the patient, both BLS and ALS. And then the third act will be the uh, post resuscitation care. Uh, you know, cut to the ending. Uh, we did. Uh, achieve ROSC and transport uh, the patient. Uh, what you're seeing also uh, is um, provided with the permission of the patient's family for the hope that it would will, will do um, some, some good out there. So uh, in this first act, what you're going to see is uh, our patient working. Uh, this is at a big box store, as Hillary mentioned, and he's it's right before the store opened in the morning. He's restocking the, I don't know, it looks like the candy aisle uh, at the checkout. Uh, this is a unwitnessed cardiac arrest captured on video. So what is, I think, particularly striking in this first act is to look at the amount of time that elapses before he is discovered. Um, and so uh, in when he collapses, and you're going to see what a 
sudden cardiac arrest looks like for real. If you've never seen one, most of us haven't. Uh, at that time in the upper left-hand corner, there will be a clock kick in that will show the elapsed time since the onset of the cardiac arrest to put that in perspective. So uh, you'll hear us, uh, you'll see the, the patient collapse, we'll speed up time, and then you will um, uh, hear the, one of the employees call 911. Uh, our system has a two-stage 911 system. All calls are received at a single county 911 center, and then medical calls are transferred to the EMD at the EMS agency. So uh, where, where prioritization and call, call screening occur. So you're gonna hear that um occur and we'll watch this go through to um to arrival of first responders um you you will see some comments i think hillary will be putting in the chat uh that will kind of raise some hopefully raise some questions or some observations you might consider so with that uh james let's go ahead and and uh start act one That's what a sudden cardiac arrest looks like. No symptoms, he just goes down. Thank you. After eight minutes, we now have a bystander trying to render some bystander care. Thank you. 911, where's your emergency? Hi, this is Chris Collins in Kalamazoo, and we need an ambulance. We have a team member down, and we think he might have passed away. What's We're not address? sure. We need immediate assistance. What's the address? Uh, 6800 West Main. And what makes sense this? Yes. Okay, and what, what exactly is going on? He's on the floor and we, we, he's not breathing. All right, stand line. I'm going to transfer to the ambulance company, okay? Thank you. Oh, go ahead. So, be for station Ashtamo 51, Ashtamo 51, 6800 West Main Street. At have a male subject there not breathing. He is an employee. 6800 West Main has on an employee not breathing. Your timeout is 701. 541, I'll show you in route. It is an elderly male. Apparently is turning color. Still not breathing. Hi, caller, tell me exactly what happened. Hi, we don't know. He's on the floor. He's not breathing. They're trying okay. CPR. Nothing's happening. We need somebody, please. We're coming, okay? Thank you. You're going to help me. Don't hang up, okay? Okay. We're going to work this through together. How old is he? Um, He's older. I don't know for okay. sure. He's definitely an older man. Okay, 70s? Probably. Okay. And he is not, is he awake? No. No. Is he breathing? No. Okay. It's going to be a med one echo. Okay, all right. Do you have uh, a defibrillator available? No, we do not. You do not? Okay. All right, listen carefully. I'm going to give you some instructions. Okay, are you right by him? I am. Okay, if you lean flat on his back without yeah, a defibrillator. They're, they're performing CPR. Okay, all right. Do they need instructions on how to do CPR? I don't know. They're working. I don't know. <laughs> okay, ask them. Do they need instructions on how to do CPR? Do they need instructions or are you certified? I was certified. I think it's probably expired. Okay. He was certified, so he, know, he, he does know. Okay, I'm going to give you the instructions. He's a couple of breaths. He's definitely purple. <clears throat> okay, we're coming, okay? I okay. want you to tell him this. Place the heel of his hand on his breastbone right between the nipples and his other hand on top of that hand. That's oh, what he's doing. That's what he's doing. He is doing that. Yes. Okay. I want him to pump the chest hard and fast at least twice per second and two inches deep. Okay. 
slow down. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let this chest come all the way up between the pumps, and we're going to do this 600 times. Okay, there's another breath. No more. No more. Did he breathe? Yeah, I think so. He's breathing? I don't know for sure, but, I mean, something happened. Okay, what happened? You guys don't I mean, know what happened. What it, did you see? He might have taken the breath, not real sure. Okay, then we're going to keep doing CPR until we know what's going on, okay? Okay. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to count this out together. We're going to do it 600 times. The pace is this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Watch, I, it's the pace I want him to be doing CPR. Okay, okay. yeah. Count. Uh, one, two, three, two, four. three, four. One, two, three, four. Not doing Don't check for pulses. I need him to keep doing CPR. Oh, they want you to keep doing it, they said. Keep doing keep it. Keep doing it. One, two, one, two three, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, He's four. One, two, sound. Okay, keep roll him over and continue, please. Uh, so that's the first. We're still not quite done with that first act. EMS will be arriving shortly, but there's so much material there. We could spend the whole hour just talking about that. We won't, but there's so much good stuff. Um, just a couple of uh, quick points. First, to be crystal clear in Michigan and specifically in Kalamazoo, we do not teach the straddle CPR technique, okay? Not uh, an approved teaching at all, okay? Uh, and uh, we also don't recommend rolling the patient on their side every 30 seconds. So, uh, but geez, where did the patient, uh, you know, where did those ideas come from with the bystander who good for the, you know, the coworker, he tried, right? He was in there pitching, right? So um, I don't know, do we have any, is, uh, Hillary, do anyone have any thoughts about the straddle or the bystander uh, rolling thing? Yeah, we definitely want to talk about how the fact that he got bystander CPR at all and um, someone was helping move that blood around and pump on his chest is going to make a difference in his outcome. Um, Peter, go ahead, because we talked about this a little bit earlier. Yeah, so Bill, uh, first of the questions I have to start, because um, it kind of jumped to the eight minute mark. This guy didn't have CPR for eight minutes total, right? That's correct, yeah. And that's because they didn't they didn't find him until the eight minute mark, correct? Yeah, exactly. So if it wasn't for the video camera, we would not have that that time to find. Uh, but this would be an unwitnessed arrest when that first bystander arrived. Uh, uh, it was eight minutes after the collapse. Pretty wild. So, so the the question I have, and since you've been doing this for such a long time, and you've had you have a lot of experience with this, is that it's my sense that when people find someone on the ground, it's a layperson. The doing of the CPR, like we talked about, is one thing. I'm happy that he got anything, but it's the recognition that, hey, CPR is even needed. So I got to give this guy credit that he figured it out and he's he's doing the CPR. I wonder if it's because he was in a small aisle and there wasn't enough room to get on the one side. Could that have been the reason he did that? Yeah, we. that's exactly it, Peter. Uh, I debriefed the, the fellow afterwards, uh, after seeing the video, because we had no idea of this until we got, it was a few days later when we were able to get the video. And I said, so what was up with this straddle thing? Is that something someone taught you? And it's like, oh no, I just, uh, I don't know. I think it was just, I felt confined because of the aisle. It's it spot on, Peter. And uh, I felt that was the way to do it. Now you'll see in a few minutes, the firefighters kept him for right or wrong in the aisle and they were able to resuscitate in a more traditional traditional manner. Um, so you, you, you got the, the, uh, the straddle technique. And then, and then the, the other part is, is the whole thing where he's turning him to the side is that, did the guy truly, did he vomit at all? Or was it just the agonal respirations that were tricking this guy into thinking, hey, he may be breathing now, let me stop what I'm doing. Um, and, also yep. the, and also the telecommunicator kept saying, she kept asking, how's he doing? Is he okay now? And you know that kind of prompting him to stop and say, hey, maybe he's breathing now. You think that's what was going on there? Yeah, what, what we were here, I, and I, again, the, the bystander that was doing the straddle CPR that would roll him, I said, well, you know, what was up with that? Uh, no, no actual vomiting occurred. What uh, he described was what he would see as a lot of, of drooling around the mouth. And he thought to himself, gee, that couldn't be good. What if he chokes on that? So uh -huh. I better roll him on his side to let that, the, the fluid drain out. Now, for a non-medical guy, that isn't actually bad 
you know, thought process there. I think it's wrong, but it's not bad. So he was trying to help the guy he was doing. And as a CPR instructor, I've never thought to say, if you notice a little bit of drooling around the mouth, like don't roll them, just keep on pumping on the chest and do your hands only CPR. So I think that's a, a simple lesson we can, yeah, you know, we can take out of here. Um, you know, one other comment too, is the, the question about you have an AED present. And this prompted us to do um, uh, kind of an inquiry looking at some couple of large databases on municipal ordinances. And we looked around the country to see how many ordinance, how many municipalities had some kind of ordinance requiring AEDs. And looking at hundreds of thousands of municipalities and ordinances, we, we could come up with like 82 that had some type of an ordinance. Uh, Michigan has none. Uh, most of the Midwest uh, have have none. So there are few and far between. Peter can tell you about the efforts mm -hmm. he made in his own uh, city in Davie, Florida, to not only have uh, AEDs, but also yep. stop the bleed kits. Peter, um, yeah. tell everybody yeah. how to do that. Yeah, I'm not going to take credit for that. But thanks, Hillary. My fire chief, Julie Downey, in 2008, said, let's put in, in, in ordinance AEDs and all the you know right size building, etc. And then when I came in, we added the, the, the stop the bleed kits. Personally, I'm trying to move Narcan into them now getting a little bit of resistance. Uh, but I think that, you know, th these kits need to be stocked with everything that we need nowadays, but yeah. Good. Bill, do we want to move along to the next clip? I, I think so. Yeah, that was, uh, again, lots of material there, but we have more to come. So what we're going to see in this next clip is you're going to see shortly the arrival of uh, the BLS fire department. And, um, and you know, real quickly on the AD, I asked the general manager of the store, why no AD? And it's like, well, the fire department is just a mile down, not even a mile down the road, and they're going to get there so quickly. And this call came in right at ship change. Everyone's dressed. Everyone's ready to go. But you can appreciate it. I think the, you know, we know how that, that hidden time of getting from point A to point B, a lot of stuff has to happen. So you're going to see the, the first the layer is going to be the BLS fire department. And then just a few minutes after that, you're going to see the ALS um, paramedics from a separate agency arriving. Uh, in Michigan, we have um, the, the fire departments and first responder agencies are staffed by either EMTs or kind of advanced EMRs, we call medical first responders. And uh, our first responders in our county are permitted to um, uh, use superglottic airways, which you'll also see we in Michigan, they're allowed right now to use just the eye gel airway at that, at that BLS uh, level. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Also, you're going to see um, uh, something a little bit unusual. We do tend to we tend to keep the AED on even after ALS arrival. The paramedics will monitor the heart rhythm separately with the limb leads, but we keep the AED on at least for the initial part of the resuscitation. So a lot of systems don't do that, uh, but that's something we've done with some success for quite a while. So you'll you'll see that. And then finally, just take particular note when the AED is turned on, you're going to start hearing audio recording. And at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the AED rhythm. And you'll see also a, a clock that will tell the elapsed time from AED being turned on. One of the challenges we had here, while we had, I think, very good CPR, you'll see it took a, a pretty long time to get the, the AED attached. And I think that's an important um, take home point. So go ahead, Hillary. Or James, yeah. please. Let yeah, go. James, go ahead. There's a little silence here. I'm going to take the time to jump in. If you didn't know, um, there are uh, cardiac monitors that allow you to record audio, and this is where we're getting audio of the actual scene. If you didn't know that, um, talk to your training officers or your chiefs and see if you can turn on your life packs and I'm seeing 30 to 2 standard CPR, two person BVM. Oh, 
iPad to patient's bare chest. So this is not the completion of Act of Act Two, but it's the first part of Act Two. So uh, you know, a couple of things here. That the thing that I, I think is is probably the most challenging is what you know is that that delay in um, getting the initial defibrillation done. And you heard just a moment ago, uh, one of the firefighters they had the pads on. We actually saw a uh, V-fib that was screaming to be defibrillated, um, but then the firefighter uh, said, "Let's reposition that pad. Move that pad up a little higher." And, um, you know, so, you know, when I first heard that, it's like, no, 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 just, just shock them, get that shock done. But as we've recently learned from uh, the dose VF trial in, from our neighbors to the north, uh, pad placement matters. So we have to strike this, this balance of getting the patient defibrillated quickly, but optimizing pad placement. So uh, ideally, when those pads first go on, they're going to be in the in the optimal position. Uh, and currently, we're still in the time of this of this uh, recording. We're using this more traditional anterolateral pad placement. Um, so uh, I, you know, you see the CPR uh, is kind of the um, you know, from my perspective, slightly biased is high performance CPR. Um, you know, they are they focus on that it, right away. It did take about 25 seconds from the initial assessment to be getting CPR uh, in violation of uh, our policies of you know, heart association 10 seconds. But then again, this would be the real world you're watching, and that's what happens in the real world. This is a very well trained fire department that uh, is that does great jobs with resuscitation, as, as you'll see continuing on. They are just in the process of placing the eye gel, and you're going to see first res or paramedics now arriving. They'll be in the white shirts. Bill, just in in response to the to the pad placement and uh, all that data coming out from Dr. Chesky's and, and Ken has been in, in, incredible. An important point that I've learned is that it's that lateral pad that oftentimes is not placed, placed lateral enough because you want to get that electricity to actually cross through the ventricle. Um, and so truly that pad placement is very critical in the AL positioning. It's less critical in the AP because it's hard to kind of miss the heart when you're going AP. Um, but, you know, I thought, I thought that was very, uh, very important. I thought your, your guys did a great job here with um, you know, the, the quality of CPR. Um, and can you just remind everybody how many personnel do you have at this particular agency and what type of training and how often do they train? Yeah, this is a, um, this is a um, co combination um, career and paid on call department. Uh, so uh, the initial responders on the first arriving engine are, are career firefighters coming out. This co uh, department covers one uh, one township of about 20,000 uh, people in Michigan, probably approximately six by um, six miles. And we've really uh, tried hard for a number of years to get resuscitation built into the regular cadence of, of, of company level drills. So uh, our hope is that at least twice a year, uh, they are breaking out the equipment and going through the drill to, to keep those skills um, sharp. And we also what do you, have, what do you, oh, go ahead, Haley. I'll have a quick comment. Really great you. question from Lorelai, who asked, did someone go back and train the staff in CPR? And we know in a fire department, there's often, um, you know, going back to the community after a fire to talk about fire safety. How great is it if there are agencies who can go back um, on an EMS call and do some retraining or, um, you know, at least some follow up with the with the folks who helped in this case? In this case? That, yeah, that's a great question. And I hate to say, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I, 
as far as I'm aware, they did not do that, but it's, a, it's such an important point. Uh, you know, and then also the thing we have to always be a little bit delicate about, but we doesn't should never be a deterrent to CPR is, you know, we don't want to give them the impression that somehow that they they failed and caused a bad outcome. So uh, certainly getting, you know, going back and let's say, hey, this is so important to see if we can't get uh, others involved and, and maybe give us a relief to this poor uh, fellow who is uh, the sole uh person to administer hands-only compression. And, and, and one of the things that a lot of agencies do that is terrific is they have reunions with the survivors and they try to bring the bystanders back and the crew and the dispatcher and the hospital and all that. But one of the things we forget is that there are plenty of bystanders, more than more than there are not, who do CPR on, on folks who don't survive. And one uh, wonderful researcher paramedic in Canada, Paul Snowblin, has made it his life's work to um, make sure they reach out to people who gave CPR, no matter what the outcome of the patient was, in order to tell them that they did a good job, they did the right thing, um, answer any questions that they have and get some closure for that, that individual who gave so much of themselves uh, to yeah. a stranger. Yeah, he's great. Uh, just I have one quick question. There's a lot of people watching Bill now that are BLS only. And I go around the country and people say, well, I, I'm only in a BLS. Um, what do you say to those people if, if the only people that showed up were these folks? Don't they have everything they need at this point in time to save this guy's life? Boy, that's that's for sure, Peter. Great point. And uh, I, I think from some of us older, uh, more experienced EMS uh, clinicians, you know, if there was a time as a former paramedic, we viewed CPR as something that circulated epinephrine to the heart so that the paramedics would save the patient. And instead, it's it's we're really understanding now that that high quality CPR, you know, isn't just something to buy time for a defibrillator or buy time for a paramedic to give a medication. It has a direct uh, benefit on the physiology of the heart, reversing, my, reversing myocardial hypoxia, acidosis, making the heart more amenable to defibrillation. Uh, this is all BLS. And in a moment when, you're, when you see the paramedics arrive, what you're gonna see with the two paramedics is one paramedic is in doing some ALS uh, interventions from the IV and medications, but the second paramedic is actually backed off and, and allowing the, the team to work in, that, in a more of a supportive role of his partner. Remember, begin CPR. Right here. Look at this Perry shock pause period. We'll talk about that in a moment. Lots of good stuff there. So, um, what? Uh, talk briefly about the eye gel. So, in our county, we were actually a very early adopter of superglottic airways, uh, going back to 2007, um, and we've gone through a variety of different iterations. Back then, it was just an alternative to endotracheal intubation for our paramedics. And uh, this was on the heels of the AHA's most current update from 2006. So we've gone through various. Um, uh, Superglottic airways. Uh, several years ago, we expanded uh, with the eye gel airway to the uh, BLS level, as you're seeing here. So the the BLS crew is inserting the eye gel. Uh, for our system, we 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 strongly promote uh, first breath um, color metric capnography, which is something we we don't otherwise use much in our in our system. We're we're fortunate that we have a relatively short 
time for ALS arrival. So we quickly transition to waveform capnography, but we think at the BLS level, sometimes simpler is better. And in this case, the paramedic is all set uh, as the eye gel is going in, they have waveform capnography. So you hear a little bantering about, don't no, hold off of the color metric, let's just go directly with first breath waveform capnography. So we think that's that really was a, um, a good thing. Uh, one of the things uh, that you'll see, you're gonna see several different defibrillations. The first three are gonna be AED um, semi-automatic defibrillations. And then the, we'll finally see a manually delivered defibrillation. When you see that, when you the first defibrillation you saw, and you're about to see these other defibrillations, uh, look at what we refer to as a peri shock pause, or in other words, the hands off the chest time uh, before and after um, the, the defibrillation. The, when we're using an AED, the, the initial, most of our current AEDs, uh, we have some new technology that may be changing that, but, but you can't be doing compression, so you have to pause. So that forces us to be off, off the chest. Then um, the, the hands of the patient are really with the computer and the AD. So it's, it's ha having to analyze, and usually that involves going through a series of four to five second um, intervals to confirm that there's a shockable rhythm or not. So we're talking about nine, maybe uh, you know, up to 14, 15 seconds for that analysis to occur while we're not pushing on the chest. Then it determines a shock is delivered, the shock is administered. Now it's on us to be able to immediately resume compressions. We don't need the team leader to say anything. We should just be getting right back on the, on the chest. That's our control. Uh, everything up to that is really in the hands of, of most of our current AEDs. We have to let them do their, their job. But then you'll see what will happen with our final defibrillation, the fourth defibrillation, in terms of shortening that peri shock pause. So, so Bill, Bill, um... Is there, is there um, use then for AEDs that, that have that switch that can be turned into manual? Because right now, um, the comment I wanted to make is that in, in, in my own system, the life pack has an AED mode. And when, when I first came into my system, there was one agency using the AED mode and it was just eating up a whole lot of time. Can you, can you discuss the, the AED mode, on an, uh, the, the manual mode on an AED and on the life pack or the Zolt? Yeah, so um, you know, I we made a decision a number of years ago. We've since replaced our ADs with a newer generation AED, but um, to 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 use ADs that had the ability to do manual defibrillation uh, for the reasons you'll see shortly. Um, now with newer generations, that that feature is less uh, common in, in newer generation ADs, and I think that what's more important is the concept. And you know, for that initial, uh, those initial shocks, um, the you know we 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 tolerate that that pause in the peri shock pause uh, for the computer to analyze. But after things settle down, that's when we really need to, if we're still in a shock uh, shockable rhythm, have some ability to to defibrillate manually. Whether that's with an AED with a manual mode, or more commonly. It's a time to switch to the to the you know the big big boy or big girl defibrillator, the ALS monitor, where we can we can deliver those shocks. If we're using an ALS monitor and we're in the AED mode of a you know conventional uh, ALS monitor, then that just should simply be just switching from the AD mode to the to manual mode. I would argue sometimes still with task saturation that is so often. Uh, with us during resuscitation, there's some intrinsic value, even with a paramedic crew walking through the door first, to flip that monitor on the AD mode while you're getting the resuscitation fundamentals in place. And then once you've got a moment, then flip it to the to the manual mode. Um, so I don't know, if, Peter, did that answer your question adequately? Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think that everyone listening today needs to kind of go back and, and evaluate that and then add that into the training. And that, that was really what I wanted to mention is that you have to know what your equipment does or doesn't do. Last comment, you know, Sheldon Chesky's in Canada, when they did the, the double sequel a sequential study, they had to have their AEDs rewired, if you will. I don't know what they did, but they had the manufacturer do it so they can make them manual mode, right? Um, and, and for those of us who are now doing double sequential, if the AED can't do it, then we have to bring two big boy monitors, as you call it, to the scene. And that's not so easy to do for a lot of people, so...
Good. I want to um, highlight a few amazing comments in the chat. First of all, uh, Rob Lawrence has pointed out rightly so that we have a few um, sudden cardiac arrest survivors in the audience, and we would love to know if uh, you want to just tell a quick part of your story in the chat. That would be great. Secondly, um, we've put up some links to some of the research that we're um, discussing, including Paul Snowblin's research. Um, and Dr. Maya Dorsett is, is uh, talking about uh, mechanical CPR as well in the chat, so make sure you check that out. Um, John uh, says it takes a progressive organization to share this video with the profession so we can all learn and benefit. And I wanted to make sure everyone heard that because we learn from each other. And that's one of the things that we love doing in real emergency. And we thank Bill Fails from the bottom of our hearts that uh, that he's able to be uh, so open and willing to share this and, and help us all learn. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, the other thing that uh, another person named John, John Kerr this time pointed out is we didn't see anyone checking for a no CPR necklace or bracelet and paperwork on the patient as the CPR and AED was initiated at all levels. You know, certainly in the chaos of the first parts of the call, that's not something with an unconscious patient and no family members nearby. I don't, I would not think that that's something that's always in, in our minds, but um, very good that, uh, that John talked about that. Um, Good. I think we're ready to keep going. We're um, getting close to kind of the last latter half of our uh, of our presentation. Interrupted. Stay clear of patient. Analyzing interrupted. Stop all motion. Hold on for a second. Analyze. Begin CPR. Stay clear of patient. Analyzing. Stay clear of patient. Shock advised. Stay clear of patient. Deliver shock. Shock delivered. Begin CPR. Okay, so this um, also illustrates that despite the EMS medical director arriving on scene, um, the team can still function somewhat <laughs> effectively. Um, so uh, so the, the gentleman uh, in the gray hoodie, kind of a balding guy, the gray hoodie at the foot end of the patient, uh, gets down on his knees and is reaching forward, uh, touching the patient, and it is kind of gently swatted back from the patient by one of the firefighters. Um, that took a little bit of time to figure that out. Uh, what was that all about? Um, and I don't know if any, or if anyone happened to have any idea in the chat at all on that, any good uh, answers that you saw? Yeah, let us know what you think. Why do you think uh, someone came by to put his, uh, yeah, Alicia says maybe it was a relative. Um, yeah, good thought. Good nope. thought. Any other guesses? Praying, says Roxanne. What, well, praying? Yeah. Yeah, you nailed it, Roxanne. Way to go. So he was a coworker who was 
say, um, let's see, uh, I don't think the right term would be off-duty pastor, but he was a co-worker who happened to be a pastor, I guess, just like a EMT or firefighter on duty 24-7. So he felt obliged to, you know, try and, and uh, reach in and touch the patient to, to, to put hands on to say a prayer just at the moment he was about to be defibrillated. So I, I think most of us would not ever oppose divine intervention in our resuscitations, but we just have to be a little bit careful about that. And I, I, while we certainly put a lot of emphasis on safety, defibrillators, including ADs, are super safe devices, probably one of the absolute safest medical devices we have. Had he had a good firm grip on the patient during the defibrillation, he wouldn't have had any problem with his hair because I don't think he had any, but you, he probably would have done just, just fine. Um, so that was the story of the gray hooded band. Then you also saw, you know, fairly timely access to um, epinephrine and lidocaine. Our system is still a little bit old school. We still use those medications. Some systems are questioning, should those even be part of the, of the, of the drill? Um, the, yeah, you know, the, um, the, um, uh, uh, paramedic uh, two trial from the UK uh, really wasn't didn't demonstrate much benefit, if any, in in uh, achieving good outcomes neurologically intact survivors. Uh, the delay, though, it was about a just a twenty one minute interval from the nine 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 their nine one one equivalent call to arrival of of uh, the paramedics or told the delivery of the epinephrine. In Michigan, we looked at that. Ours is a little bit better. We were about 14 minutes from 911 call to uh, delivery of epinephrine. So we, I don't think, I think we're still struggling with, does epinephrine have a place in modern resuscitation at what dose, at what, uh, what delivery system? And I know, I know there's all kinds of different opinions on that. The same with lidocaine or amiodarone. We switched to lidocaine a number of years ago from amiodarone uh, without strong evidence that one is better than the other. Just technically to deliver it, it's just with a pre-filled, and old timers know what this means, uh, uh, getting that pre-filled syringe attached and administered, is, it just seems to be a little faster with, with, uh, with lidocaine. Um, thoughts, team? Yeah. yeah, so Bill, and I, I wanted to bring, you know, get Maya in, I want to get Mark and, and David in. Because you, you're, you're, the folks are doing an amazing job, clearly with the intention of staying on scene, and you know we have we have some physicians here on on, on the call, and I want them to at least reiterate or tell everyone on the call how they feel that you know I think for a long time people just felt like we need to get these people to the to the hospital. So, my maybe we'll start with you, go to David, and then Mark. What are your thoughts on on staying versus going? I think they absolutely need to stay. And I think that this is also particularly staying in a public location, right? Because very often we have stay on scene and then there's the public location aspect. And sometimes the public location is cited as a reason to move early, um, which is right, like would have been a disaster for this particular patient. Um, so as we sort of all in, look to see the care that they arrived, it would have completely interrupted the priorities of care, which well, you know, we got the medications on board. We got those other things on board. Really, the priorities of care were uninterrupted CPR and good quality compressions. Um, and so the, the big kudos is they stayed on scene in a public location and continued to provide good care to this patient past the 20 minute mark because this patient remained in ventricular fibrillation. Right. And, and, uh, I, and you know what I, I think to that comment, Maya, is that if you're really good at what you do, you want people watching you. That's my opinion anyway, but uh, David. I agree. Uh, I, agree. I think yeah. they're role, role modeling really good care. And uh, I think the key thing to comment, just to add what Maya said, is that the continuous excellent uh, care of BLS is key. I know, I know we talk about ACLS, but the continuous excellent BLS uh, performance is important uh, to sustain. So I agree and, with Maya. And, and, and David, as someone who does pediatric emergency medicine, um, like me, right? What, what what are your thoughts? If this was a, a two-year-old kid, same thing, right? Same thing, you know, and it's a different thing because unfortunately, many of the young children that we see are unwitnessed arrests and uh, and oftentimes they're futile. But the fact that you have an opportunity like this or with a child potentially that is a witness arrest, you would want to try to continue BLS. And I always focus when a child comes into the ED, I always focus the team 
on BLS, that who's going to be doing the switch outs, the timing, and it's BLS, BLS, BLS is so key and critical. Great, great point. And Mark, as an ICU doc, um, and by the way, it's really the ICU people who, who write our out-of-hospital guidelines. What are your thoughts? You're, you're a pre-hospital guy who happens to be an ICU doc. What are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's obvious here that effective on-scene interventions made the difference and saved this guy's life. So no question about it. And it may, it may often be that the hospital provi providers think, just, just get them here to us and we'll fix the problem when it's actually for cardiac arrest and, and trauma and other conditions, other time-sensitive conditions, performing effective interventions, resuscitation on, the, on, the, on scene in the ambulance are, um, are important. And this whole scenario demonstrates that incredibly. I will say, I wish, I, I felt bad for them being crammed into that little aisle and I wished... Uh, <laughs> Kept wanting to pull the whole group out into the bigger, into a, into a wider space. But are you kidding, Mark? That's our jam. We 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 get <laughs> people next to the toilet. So, That's how we so, roll. And speaking, I'll just say one other that. thing: just the, the the value of the video and the the video review in our own. I wish I, I wish we could video every one of my own resuscitations because I know there'd be tons of opportunities for improvement in every one. But I think the value of this and Bill, thanks to you and your team. I know there's some of your trainers on here. Just thanks for being willing to share it and help us all learn from the small opportunities there are that we have here to learn. So th and thanks then, for thanks for bringing it. Mark, Mark, great comments. And I'm going to bring in Zach. So Zach, you've been in many situations where you're the guy and they're all looking at you and your team. How do you feel in these situations? Like uh, Maya mentioned in a public place, uh, what, what's, what's your mindset, uh, your, your state of mind? Well, I think the number one thing is to train for it. So usually we train in a nice open area where it's nice and quiet and we're just kind of going through the motions. So you have to train in, in this type of environment. So whatever that looks like for you with a lot of people, a lot of things going on when you're actually in it, though, you're in the moment and you're you're doing what you're trained to do. Um, to Dr. Spiro's point, the little things are what matter in this. So we say, OK, everybody agrees that it's all about BLS care, but I would take it a step further and say, it's all about where you place the pads the first time. It's all about how you insert the eye gel. It's all about, you know, how are you communicating to limit the time off of the chest, the, the slow uh, peri shock pauses, all of that stuff, those, those little things are what are gonna make the difference. And then once you get the basics down, we all can go our own, you know, kind of way on what we think as far as what we should be doing is at the progressive level, but the, the basics are what really matter. And to get that uh, nailed down, recording what you do, as Dr. Peel said, is so important. So even if you don't have body cams and you can't do it live, record your scenarios in your training. I guarantee you, you'll be shocked to find out how long it takes you to put a Lucas on usually if you're not training for it or how long you actually stay off of the chest, um, how long it takes you to get access or put an epi in. Recording what you do, you'll find out that you're probably not near as good at doing some things as you think you are. And you're maybe a lot better than maybe you that you weren't. So um, I would highly, highly recommend to record what you're doing. And there's been a lot of questions about pit crew CPR. One thing to comment on that is, is I think that you've got to do it. The main thing is it's assigning roles. So regardless of who is there, um, whether that's a physician or a police officer, BLS, ALS, everybody has a role in a position, it eliminates some of the chaos and makes it more efficient. So um, that's a, that's a, a point that I would really like to, to drive home. And then lastly, immediate feedback. Immediate feedback to crews is so important. Good, bad, ugly, and different because um, the longer that it goes, the, you know, our minds wander and maybe we don't realize how long it was uh, that, that we did certain interventions. And so that immediate feedback from your quality improvement team, your medical director is super, super important. Great. And I'm going to jump in with one really important question because it really gets to what we're talking about. Um, what, what is the time frame? Is it arbitrary? When do we declare that this can be terminated? Um, or is it based on a rhythm or is it a little bit of both? For those people who are not uh, incorporating this in their agencies right now, what guidance can we give um, for many of the docs on the call in terms of uh, how, we long, how long we stay on scene before we make a de determination? I mean, I, I, I could speak from a PED standpoint. I mean, the fact that he's still in VFib is, you know, I'm, and what the rhythm is showing is important. I mean, for a child, unfortunately, again, like I mentioned earlier, children who come in in uh, unwitnessed arrests, oftentimes they're, they're in asystole. And so we, we stop those resuscitations in 20 minutes, but this seems to be like a completely different situation for an adult. And Hillary, 
Oh, go, go ahead, Mark. I'll I was just going to com- I was just going to call out Joseph Zalkin's comment that 40 is the new 20. Uh, <laughs> 40 is like to that. Yeah. That is My, about the, that's about the amount of time they spent, right, Bill? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 40 yeah. total minutes uh, for until they got our Rosk, right? Well, until yeah, they got him out of there. 40 yeah. from the time of the arrest till the time he left the scene. Yeah. But but I, I, you know, I, our, our motto, and, and I haven't yet been able to get the, the team to paint this on the side of their of their rigs, uh, you know, work them to death on scene. You know, and it doesn't really have much appeal from a marketing standpoint, but, <laughs> but that's the concept is, you know, our, and, and it's a mindset that, that the troops have to believe in. And when you start to see some good outcomes, cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac arrest can be a survivable condition uh you know we saw that recently in an nfl game right so it but it it, it's not by accident because we're working them and we're 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 working them aggressively on scene Uh, the 40 minutes i i think is reason we have almost every year one or two arrests that are 40 minutes or longer and often they're in and out of resuscitation etc but still can have a good neurologic outcome so i you know like any complex medical decision it it requires you to look at the totality of information and, you know, it, this is really hard to have a rigid, we've hit 40 minutes and we stop, you know, uh, there are some patients where you stop well before 40, unwitnessed, asystolic the entire time, low end tidal CO2s, we're not working those for 40 minutes. But this is a patient with, even though it was unwitnessed, he's giving us something that we can work with. So Maya, go ahead. And then I'll go after Maya. Yeah, yeah. we, we got to wrap up quickly. So uh, let's do just a few more comments and we'll show the last part. I was going to say that the rhythm is everything, um, and it depends what other resources you are. So you should never transport a patient for, like, the only thing you should ever transport is that the patient needs a resource that you don't have. And I think the only one that I can really think about in cardiac arrest is ECMO for refractory V-fib. So if you're not someplace where you have ECMO for refractory V-fib in a distance that it's going to make a difference, then there isn't something that you're going to be transporting them for. You have everything else that you need. I love that comment. That that was one of the comments I was going to make. So thanks for making that. And the other one, other people have mentioned the end tidal CO2 is a huge, huge marker here. Um, I can say that we brought people to the hospital with good end titles and the doctor basically says, how long have you been working them? Oh, 30 minutes. And then they walk out of the room, literally. So we have to stop thinking that it's just a matter of time. Eric Jager had a great comment in the chat as well. So uh, great comments. Hillary, let's I'll get it back to you. Yeah, let's let's show the end. Everyone wants to know what happened. Um, so let's get the information about what happens with the last part of care. And then, Bill, you can tell us what happened with the patient. The level stop now. Press the pressing arm button. Shot the level. Let's get a little deep running pressure. Stay with the man. Let's prep a second. So now a three. Just close down. Three-second peri-shock pause with manual defibrillation in this case. Big jump in end tidal CO2 from the mid-30s to the low 50s. Here. Just, uh, Bill, can you quickly run through these and then we'll go to the next slide with uh, yeah, you, the patient yep, stuff. You bet. So what what we've had for a number of years is what we refer to as a post-resuscitation 10-minute bundle of care. The 10 minutes sometimes confuses people. But what we say is it used to be if we got pulses back, we'd high five and we'd get them in the back of the ambulance and we'd rush them to the hospital. We realize now that our job is not over. It's just kind of starting now because we're transitioning to post-resuscitation care. So we get pulses back in our system. We give them a permission to have 10 minutes on scene to, to get this stuff done. If they get it done in seven or eight minutes, they can go to the 
get, get begin transport. But full set of vital signs, 12 lead EKG, uh, optimize uh, hemodynamics. We, we shoot for a systolic blood pressure greater than 120. Uh, IV fluids wide open, which almost all of our cardiac risk can t- patients can tolerate fine. Uh, even if their pressures aren't bad, and often they're at the heels of some epinephrine, so they come out somewhat hypertensive, that can fizzle out pretty quickly. We will have um, what we refer to as push dose epinephrine, um, cardiac epinephrine, diluted uh, by 10 to 1 to 100,000, and then uh, optimize oxygenation of uh, maniacal attention, as Dan Spade would say, to um, to avoiding hyperventilation, making darn sure that airway is well secured, and then drawing up and having ready sedation medication so that if the patient does start to buck the tube, you've got something ready to go. And then the next slide real quick, we'll do his vitals and then talk about his outcome. Yep. So this this kind of reflects that 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 hypertension 159 over 116, probably coming off the, that, that IV milligram of epinephrine that was administered. Uh, the EKG is probably hard to see. The, you know, in these defib patients, the 12 lead EKG, while it's important and we do it, what we see is it's often kind of all over the place, uh, very dynamic until the patient kind of settles down. In this case, we saw some ST segment depression, but no clear STEMI. Uh, subsequent blood pressure started to trend down 147. Uh, the patient started to buck the tube. We administered midazolam for tube tolerance. Uh, fluid bolus was given. And then as that pressure hit 105 over 67, uh, the, pa- the paramedics already had push dose epinephrine ready to go and were able to give just small little baby doses, 10 micrograms at a time to impl- improve that blood pressure. Do you have a final outcome of the patient? Yep, coming up next. Okay. Go ahead. Yep. Bill, you can just talk about it. Yep. So, uh, yep, that's fine. So uh, the patient was, uh, we got ROSC, uh, and uh, as you saw, and the patient was loaded carefully and transported to the hospital. Uh, the hospital was not the closest hospital. It was the patient's preferred hospital uh, per family. So it was a little, a little bit further away. Uh, the ambulance, since the patient had stabilized, and we took a couple of firefighters with the ALS crew, went non lights and siren about a 18 minute transport time. And uh, the patient was, went uh, for coronary angiography uh, where his coronaries were open. He had no culprit lesion. This was a primary dysrhythmia that got him a. Uh, automated implantable defibrillator. Uh, he was on a ventilator, not looking too good for about three days. On the fourth day, he started to show neurologic improvement and then rapidly uh, improved to where he was extubatable, was discharged from the hospital neurologically intact, and is actually back to work in that same store, uh, which is, is quite cool. Just a little extra uh, cool part, we found out he was a retired firefighter, former firefighter and retired um, police officer, and his wife was a retired police officer. So that made it even extra special. Outstanding. Thanks. Bill, again, this is just outstanding. Um, we have uh, Alicia who says, straddle CPR does work. Yep. <laughs> I just want exactly. to say I'm, I, I, I'm getting chills. You know, this is yeah. the kind of thing that we all work for. And, uh, you know, what an honor to have you here and speak with us. And, you know, uh, uh, thanks to the family to allow them to uh, allow us to learn from yes. this experience. So thank you. Um, we are just getting tons and tons of um, great uh, feedback here for this uh this high performance CPR episode, um, mostly because we're so thrilled that Dr. Phils was here to give this to us, and uh, and it wasn't death by death by PowerPoint. And, and Hillary, uh, so first of all, I want a huge thanks to Bill uh, for for everything that you do. Um, you know, I don't know if many of you know this, but Bill is just an incredible educator, and he 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 gives this presentation to um, new and incoming medical directors. Um, I remember seeing this, and just I was. Floor, I'm, I'm seeing it again for, for the second or third time. I'm still floored by it. So thank you so much. The comments and, and, and the bantering and dialogue has been great. I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, today and to share our story. Uh, keep up the fight uh, and everyone stay safe. Take care of yourselves out there. Thanks so much.
911, where's your emergency? Hi, this is Chris Collins in Kalamazoo, and we need an ambulance. We have a team member down, and we think he might have passed away. What's We're not address? sure. We need immediate assistance. What's the address? Uh, 6800 West Main. And what makes sense is this? Yes. Okay, and what, what exactly is going on? He's on the floor, and we, we, he's not breathing. All right, Samuel, and I'm going to transfer to the ambulance company, okay? Thank you. Oh, go ahead. This will be for station Oshtimo 51, Oshtimo 51, 6800 West Main Street. I have a male subject there not breathing. He is an employee. 6800 West Main has on an employee not breathing. Your timeout is 701. 541, I'll show you in route. It is an elderly male, apparently is turning color, still not breathing. Hi, caller, tell me exactly what happened. Hi, we don't know. He's on the floor. He's not breathing. They're trying okay. CPR. Nothing's happening. We need somebody, please. We're coming, okay. Thank you. You're going to help me. Don't hang up, okay. okay. We're going to work this through together. How old is he? Um, He's older. I don't know for okay. sure. He's definitely an older man. Okay, 70s? Probably. Okay. And he is not, is he awake? No. No. Is he breathing? No. Okay. It's going to be a med one echo. Okay, all right. Do you have uh, a defibrillator available? No, we do not. You do not? Okay. No, I don't. All right, listen carefully. I'm going to give you some instructions. Okay, are you right by him? I am. Okay, if you lean flat on his back without yeah, a little they're, they're performing CPR. Okay, all right. Do they need instructions on how to do CPR? I don't know. They're working. I don't know. Okay, ask them do they need instructions on how to do CPR. Do they need instructions or are you certified? I was certified. I think it's probably expired. Okay. He was certified, so he, know, he, he does know. Okay, I'm going to give you the instructions. He's a couple of breaths. He's definitely purple. <clears throat> okay, we're coming, okay. I want you to tell him this. Place the heel of his hand on his breastbone right between the nipples and his other hand on top of that hand. That's oh, what he's doing. doing. That's what he he's doing. doing that. Yes. Okay, I want him to pump the chest hard and fast at least twice per second and two inches deep. Okay. Slow down. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let this just come all the way up between the pumps, and we're going to do this 600 times. Okay, there's another breath. No more. No more. No more. Did he breathe? Yeah, I think so. He's breathing? I don't know for sure, but, I mean, something happened. Okay, what happened? You guys I don't mean, know what happened. What it, 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 he might have taken the breath, not real sure. Okay, then we're going to keep doing CPR until we know what's going on, okay? Okay. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to count this out together. We're going to do it 600 times. The pace is this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. What's, uh, what's the pace I want him to be doing CPR? Okay, okay. yeah. Count. Uh, one, two, three, two, four. Three, four. One, two, three, four. They're not doing Don't check for pulses. I need him to keep doing CPR. Oh, they want you to keep doing it, they said. Keep doing keep it. Keep doing it. One, two, one, two three, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, He's four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, keep rolling over and continue, please. One, two, three, four. Keep doing it. One, three, four. What are you then, doing? It's like a... Uh, uh, <laughs> is he responding? No. No, okay. No. All right. One, two, three. Okay, they're doing ambulances here, I think. Down here. Okay, well, don't stop doing it. I want you to okay, keep working yeah. on them. Keep one, going. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, Can you two, ask them to drink? The ambulance is coming. Firefighters. Are they still doing CPR? Yes. The firefighters okay. are here. The firefighters are with you? Yeah. Okay. You guys did a great job. You guys did a wonderful job. Okay. We'll be thinking of them today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Problem cab connector next to flashing light. Stop 
CPR. Stay clear of patient. Analyze them. Stay clear of patient. Shock advised. Stay clear of patient. Shock delivered. Begin CPR. Yeah, 115. I guess uh, 